Tis the prayer of my heart that it be found, found faithful. So far as I know, there was no dedication of my life personally. But God called me. And so I want to, even in my grandfather days, dedicate my life to him. And I want to lead families to dedicate their children to him. Because without that, dear friends, in this day and time, it's not going to serve us well. Inside your bulletin this morning is the 24-hour prayer schedule, and we have uh, two places left. The 12 o'clock noon, I'm sorry, Larry and Debbie beat you to it. So uh, 12 o'clock noon is taken, and there is a time for an hour of prayer at 4 and a time for an hour of prayer at 6. If you would be willing to spend an hour of prayer the week of September the 21st through September the 28th, every day to spend that hour, that designated hour in prayer. Pilar has already sent the names that we have with these three vacant hours on it. She's already sent it to Harvest America. You will see and note the Harvest America simulcast event in your bulletin. We need to fill up this church, do we not? On October the 5th at 4 p.m. And so we'll be looking for you. You continue to work and invite. And if you received one of these little cards last week and you have written the names on it for people for whom you're praying, then be sure that I get this card. The bottom part tears off, and all I need is just the little bottom part. You keep the top one with the same names on it so that you will be reminded of those for whom you are praying during that hour. And uh, it, uh, it was kind of a neat time, uh, was it not, on Wednesday night? We found out we could pray a long time, uh, you know, just with the prayer time that we had on Wednesday night. And I want you to pray also uh, for services this afternoon. Brother Lauren, are you for Park Place? You and Jane, is that correct? Yeah, okay, all right, no, no major changes. Uh, Brother Gwen, uh, you for uh, Regents? Yeah. All right, and uh, Esther, Bonita, Marie? All right, all right. So uh, these are the four going over to Regents uh, Care Center uh, for worship this afternoon. Now, are you ready to turn to the word? Uh, the, the title of the sermon this morning is When Brothers Fight. Uh, I was going to uh, uh, make a little bit of a uh, euphemism out of that, but I decided that we'd just be brutally honest that bro and say that brothers fight. You know, if you got more than one brother in your house, you are going to have a fight. So that's, that's just the nature of the human game. And you'll see the scriptures that I have chosen to help us understand something that God wants to say to us about the Christian life and the Christian witness and how important it is that we bring honor and glory to God. Friends, everything that we do as a church, we need to do to bring honor and glory to God Almighty. Everything that we do needs to be done to lift up God uh, for too long. The world has begun to focus upon itself. And we come to worship God and we say, uh, God, it's not for your glory that I go. Lord, I want you to help me with my rent this week and I'm going to be good and go to church. Lord, I want you to help me with my sobriety this week and I'm going to be good and go to church. We didn't come to church to honor and magnify and glorify God. God, I want you to heal my wife. And so I'm going to go to church and preach this morning. Should I have come with that in mind, I did not come to honor and glorify God. I came for my own self. Now then, when we will get it into our hearts and into our human beings, when we will get it then to the entrance of our, the gateway of our souls, 
when we get it there, that when we come to worship God, then these blessings will flow out of that when we worship him and give him the honor and the glory. But if we have come for ourselves, uh, that's all for which we have chosen to be here. And uh, so therefore I say to us that we as a congregation of God are being tested. We as a congregation of God are being invited by him to give him the honor and the glory in some of the more difficult instances and circumstances that we have known in our lives. Some of us are traveling pathways that we have not yet traveled previously. We have come to this place because of the grace and the goodness and the nurture of our Lord. And he is asking us to give him the glory that he has sustained us, that he has kept us, and that he has called us before his throne of grace. Is anybody listening? Amen. That we need to focus upon God. Now, in the scripture in Isaiah, there, uh, last week I talked to us about uh, I, I talked to us about Moab last week and how uh, uh, Moab, the Moabites, came into existence. I want to talk to us today about Edom and the Edomites. Now, these are enemies of the Jewish. Descendants of Jacob. These are enemies of Israel. These are enemies of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And for last week and this week, talking about the enemies of God. And we saw last week against the Moabites when God chooses whatever time that is to judge the Moabites. I don't want to go back and relook at that. That was hard enough to look at last week. I don't want to go back and redo it this week, all right? But God will judge the Moabites. Now, who are the modern-day Moabites? I remind you that basically within that general framework of locale, uh, we would call them Iraqis today. And the Iraqis are divided among themselves three or four, 12 different ways, who knows, uh, the Shiites, uh, the Shia, and the Sunnis. Uh, those are the two major tribes, as I understand it, listening to the news media. And so not even all of the enemies of God are united. And you remember last week that I gave us that scriptural teaching that there will in time, in God's choosing, come on the human scene a man who can unite all of the fighting tribes against the Jewish people. Right now, it seems like everybody is fighting the Jewish people. Amen? Amen. But they're not all united. And so they just pick their individual fights with the Jewish people. Now, the Moabites were on the east side of the Jordan River. And... Uh, uh, Basically, as I said, uh, we could characterize uh, their descendants as living in Iraq today. Now, today we want to look at the Edomites, and we will characterize them as living on the west side of the Jordan, and they are residents, inhabitants, basically, of the Gaza Strip between Jerusalem and Egypt. And so from the Moabites on the east side of the river to the Edomites on the west side of the river, God had a word that he gave Isaiah and said to them, Isaiah, let that group of people know the judgment that I have picked for them. Now that one about the Edomites, we want to look and just see how those brothers fought, and there came to be Moabites and Edomites, but in this instance, Edomites. And here's the word in Isaiah. The oracle, and there is that word, that's the message from God. Uh, the oracle concerning Edom. And when Isaiah wrote this, he did so to achieve the impact that God had a word 
to the Jewish people concerning Edom. Uh, he, this word was for the Edomites, but they're, uh, they're not going to listen to it. Uh, they don't worship God. They worship Allah. They worship another God. And they've all got their gods and so on and so forth. But they do not worship the God of gods, the king of kings. And so this word, the oracle concerning Edom, was a word to the Jewish people about their enemies, the Edomites. One keeps calling to me from Seir. Now that's the region where the Edomites lived. Watchman, how far gone is the night? Now, basically, we might say, what did I do? We don't know where you're at. Oh, I'm in the Bible. That's the best I can do for you. <laughs> yeah, it's in the bulletin. Isaiah chapter 21, verses 11 and 12. Isaiah, I, I didn't say that. I just knew where I was, and I thought you did too. Yep. Uh, Isaiah chapter 21, verses 11 and 12. And this is God's word to the Edomites the oracle concerning Edom. One keeps calling to me from Seir, that is, uh, from the region of the Edomites. Watchman, how far gone is the night? Basically, we might say today, how much longer do I have? Hmm. And if you and I are caught up in lives of sin and rebellion and resistance to God. That may be a pretty important question for you. How much more time do I have to keep on sinning? If I'm stealing from my boss, how much more time do I have before I get caught? If I am undermining a fellow worker with lying and so on, how much more time do I have before I get caught? If I'm the candy man and I'm dealing it out, how much more time do I have before the man catches me? If I'm addicted to alcohol and other substances, how much more time do I have? before the end of my days. You see, we keep asking, how much more time do I have? But I want you to see something here. This word of God given to Isaiah the prophet regarding the Edomites was to a sinning nation. How much more time do I have to sin? Now let's turn that and might we ask the question as Christians, Oh God, I want to see my father and mother come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How much more time? Watchman, how far gone is the night? How much more time do I have? I want to see my husband or my wife come to know uh, Jesus, come to faith in Christ. Watchman, how far gone is the night? How much more time do I have? My children, Oh, this precious one growing to come to the age of accountability. How much more time does she have? And so I think we can look at this from both directions. If we are sinning, how much more time do we have to continue in sin before judgment comes? Because that's the main focus of this word. But were we to make a spiritual scriptural application for Christians make that application we can equally say how much more time do I have to bring my lost loved ones to faith in Christ and for emphasis you know that in the Old Testament you've been to enough Baptist churches and Baptist preaching services to know that in the Old Testament if something is said once it's important if something is said twice it's really important Okay, look at it. One keeps calling to me from Seir. Watchman, how far gone is the night? Watchman, how far gone is the night? And the watchman says, morning comes. But also the night. The morning is going to be here, but it will bring with it the night and the judgment. So it will be the day and the night. The day of the Lord. 
Morning comes, but also the night. And if you would inquire, then inquire. Come back again. But Edom, the message is going to be the same. Judgment will be upon you. Now, where in the world did we get the idea about the brothers? Turn in your Bibles with me as I turn uh, in, uh, and discover the book of Genesis, and we'll look at chapter 32. And we'll find something that may or may not uh, provide a little dab of insight for us. Chapter 32. Now, you'll remember uh, that all of the Jewish people descended from Abraham. Amen? And you'll remember the issue and the matter with uh, uh, Rachel, uh, uh, Sarah. You'll remember the matter with Sarah and Hagar. How Sarah said, Hagar, you go and have relations with my husband. And maybe the son that will be born can be mine. Now that was not God's plan. And so the thing got messed up big time right there. But uh, uh, then came Isaac. And Isaac bore Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau did not get along. Brothers are not the same. Well, duh. Brothers are not the same. And Jacob was a quiet, stay-at-home, conniving, tricker, always figuring how he could trick his brother. Because his brother was out in the field hunting, Harvesting, doing whatever guy types like to do whenever they go out there and do whatever they do. Now that was Esau. And Esau was always out there somewhere. And he would come home and he would bring his father some kind of meat that he had killed some kind of produce that he had harvested. Bring those gifts to his father. And Jacob was sitting at home, figuring out how he could make his brother look like a fool. Hello. Anybody ever been there? Mm-hmm. Sitting at home, figuring out how he could get back at his brother. Because... His daddy loved Esau. And now you'll recall, will you not, that after one of Esau's hunting trips, he came home starved to death. And Jacob had outguessed him and fixed up lunch. And Esau said, I'm starving to death. Give me some of that soup. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright and a will. Now, birthright may not mean much to us today, but it meant something to the Jewish people because it meant that the one who received the birthright from the father got twice the inheritance of the other kids. And so Jacob said to Esau, you hungry? Mm, man, doesn't this look good? Mm, smells good too. And Esau starving to death. And he said, give me a bowl of that. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright. And Esau, short-sighted, the man of the moment, I got $500 and I am at the Megabucks machine and I I'm a man of the moment. And 500 bucks later, you are flat dab broke. And the machine is still rolling for the next sucker. You see, we are people of the moment. And that was Esau. Having sold his birthright, 
The brothers just fought from then on. I'll not take time to go through all the stuff that they went through with their father and how Jacob was able to parlay that uh, birthright uh, to be bestowed upon him by the father. I'll not take time for that. If you do not know the scripture, then this is an opportunity for you to begin reading uh, the book of Genesis and discover this wonderful, horrific story. Now, in Genesis 32, as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. And Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named the place Mahanaim. Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir. Does that ring a bell? What did Isaiah say? Back over there in the 21st chapter. Concerning Edom, one keeps calling to me from Seir. Now then, back in Genesis, Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. Now, this was just one more trick on the part of Jacob because Jacob had tricked his father-in-law and he had become a wealthy man. And uh, uh, Jacob still was the trickster. Now, we continue with some important uh, point in the story in Genesis 36. So turn in your Bible to the 36th chapter of Genesis and we'll read two verses there. So Esau... This is verse 8. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. And look how the Bible plainly states it. Seir is the same as Edom and the same as Esau. So when you're reading the Bible and you come to the word Seir, you will know that it is referring to Esau or the land of Edom. When you see the word Esau after this great conclusion of disagreements between these brothers, you'll know that it refers to the land of Seir or the land of Edom. These then are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. Now what is going to happen Isaiah simply gets this brief, brief word from God. Now, I want you to take a minute before you go to sleep uh, to find the book of Obadiah. Now, don't quit looking for that book. You'll find Daniel, and then you'll find Hosea, and then after Hosea, you will find Joel. Then you will find, after Joel, the book of Amos. And after you have gone through the book of Amos, where do you get? Huh? The book of Obadiah. And I want us to find it. Because, beloved, this is the word that God had for Isaiah concerning the enemies of God's people. Why in the world does America continue to support Israel? Why in the world? Because Netanyahu is blasting and bombing Gaza and killing innocent people there. Why in the world do we continue to support Israel? And the book of Obadiah tells us what is going to happen to the Edomites who resisted God and who tricked their way into existence. I didn't think I was going to come down here, but here it comes. If you and I get where we have gotten 
by trickery. It's not going to continue holding water. It just won't. And Esau, the man of the moment, allowed Jacob to trick him. And the only caveat, I'll give you the final, final conclusion of this thought this morning right now. The only caveat to Jacob the trickster, he was chosen by God. And God worked on his spirit of trickery until Jacob fought through the night and he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. And friends, if you and I fight with God, it's going to cause us to limp. Keep on. And you'll be limping along. And so God, having selected Jacob, said to the descendants of Esau, in the land of Seir, the Edomites. What did he say? Here we go. It's in the book of Obadiah. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. And this entire little book, so short, shortest book in the Old Testament, is a word from God concerning people who resist God, who deny Him and never come to worship Him. And so this word, I will say, I've got probably five minutes and it'll only take me 35 to say it. Do you remember when, the, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt? You remember that great big story? And they you got into the Red Sea and how God had to part the Red Sea. The naysayers say that that was not the Red Sea, that it was simply the word for reed, the reed sea. And it really wasn't all that deep. A great, great minister said one day, it's amazing to me how an entire Egyptian army can drown in water knee deep. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so you just let God part the sea. And when Esau and Jacob came along and began to fight, they split ways. And Esau took the hill country west of the Jordan. But he resisted God. He did not worship the God of Jacob. He worshiped Allah and other gods. And when the children of Israel came along under Moses and they wanted to go up to Jerusalem on the west side of the Jordan River, the descendants of Esau stood in their way. Esau stood in their way and said, you're not going to come through here. Your herds will trample down all of the grass, all of the feeding. You're too many. You're not going to come this way. And it meant that the children of Israel were demanded to wander so much longer in the wilderness. And that one act, friends, culminated the fight between Jacob and Esau and forever split them apart. You want to keep fighting, fighting and fussing with your loved ones? Not a good idea, beloved. 
Not a good idea. Oh, praise God. I've been in churches where the illustration would have fit. Church members, you want to keep on fighting with one another? That's not a good idea. Do you know the great joy and blessing of my heart and life is? I don't even have to bring that up here. We're too afraid to try to stand by ourselves, aren't we? Yeah. Huh? Listen, beloved, if we don't stand together, it's, it's going to be a mess for the one that wanders off out here in the briar patch. And when Esau said, you cannot come through my land and forced the descendants of Jacob to continue wandering in the wilderness. On the day that you stood aloof, Oh, no, wait a minute, verse 10. In, in Obadiah, verse 10. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame, and you will be cut off forever. Now, as Jerusalem fought its enemies, did the brother Esau come and help Jacob? No, no, no. Verse 11. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off Jacob's wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Not only did you not come and help Jacob when Jerusalem was under siege by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, whoever else is in that list, the Edomites never came to help. And in time, on the day of judgment, verse 12, do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the way of their distress. You do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. And do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down the fugitives and do not imprison their survivors in the day of distress. And judgment will come. upon all who stand in resistance to God. The day of judgment will come upon all those who stand in resistance to God. This delivered in weakness. This delivered with the hope and the prayer that we will not side with the Moabites or the Edomites but that we will not fight with our and that we will not fight with our brothers as we lift up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because I'm here to tell you God's got a word for those who resist him and it is not a good one 